So now we are at the last uh, but not least uh, talk of the of our session today. So if you are just uh, dialing in, then um, uh, this is educational session two uh, and uh, on phase lock loops. Uh, my name is Sudeep Shaker, and I'm co-chairing this session with Professor uh, Wugan Ri of Tsinghua University. And our last speaker is uh, is is Mario Markulik. Um, I'm sorry, I'm butchering the name probably, um, who received his um, electrical engineering master's degree in, from University of Zagreb and the PhD degree from uh, University of Brussels. Um, he is a, currently a research scientist at IMAC, where he works on mixed signal circuits for radar applications and next gen generation wireless communication. He's authored and co-authored several publications and patents on PLLs and ADCs, a book on frequency synthesis, and is a co-recipient of ISCC 2019 Lewis Award winner for outstanding paper. So we will now move on to the recorded video. If you have any questions, please uh, ask them through the chat messenger. And at the end of the talk, the author will answer the question. Good day to everyone joining in for this presentation, independently of the time zone you're tuning in from. It's really a pleasure to be uh, part of this conference and part of this educational session on PLLs. I've been invited to talk about subsampling PLLs for frequency synthesis and phase modulation. And in my presentation, I'll cover some basics, but we will also look, look into uh, some innovation uh, that we in iMac have uh, recently explored. This talk follows a certain bottom-up approach. Uh, so what that means is that we will start by looking into subsampling PLL basics. Then in the next step, we will increase the complexity and extend the basic subsampling loop uh, so that it becomes capable of fractional synthesis. In the third part, we will look into the digital to time converter, uh, which is the key component that enables fractional synthesis. In the fourth part of this talk, um, I want to discuss background calibration techniques that can really enhance a lot uh, the basic high performance analog core when it comes to fractional synthesis and modulation. And in the far par fi final part of this talk, uh, we will look into subsampling PLL based phase modulation. A little bit of uh, motivation at first. The subsampling PLL is really a popular architecture recently. The main reason why is because this loop offers you the possibility to achieve really great uh, figures of merit. What uh, figure of merit in PLLs typically shows you is how much jitter is your loop producing given the power consumption you're using? And it turns out that the subsampling environments uh, really show a great trade off between these two values, both in integer n uh, operation modes, indicated here with red circles, and in fractional n operation modes, indicated here with red squares. There are other reasons why the subsampling PLL is so popular. Uh, one of them is that to build, you know, a basic architecture for, for integer N synthesis, you do not need to dig into any digitization complexity, which is typically related to classical digital PLLs. Uh, it's a simple analog loop. Basically, it's built out of a switch, a capacitor, a transconductor, and a loop filter and of course uh, VCO, it doesn't get much more uh, simpler than that. And it turns out that in order to stabilize this loop, you only need to be familiar with the classical analog um, equations for loop stability that nobody's afraid anymore. In other words, to make a subsampling PLL, you need a good analog designer. You don't need, uh, for instance, an analog and a digital designer that end up uh, having to make some complex mixed mode simulations that you need to do when you're designing, for instance, a digital PLL. An analog PLL, uh, a subsampling analog PLL, is also very popular, in my opinion, because it's 
uh, scaling friendly, although it's an analog loop. Basically, as I said, it's built out of a switch, which is continuously improving uh, with uh, newer technologies. Capacitors, they get denser uh, and higher, so they consume less area. Transconductor is anyway a component that operates in um, the current domain, hence is not susceptible to, to scaling of the um, supply level voltages. And the loop filter, as I said, also gets only smaller in newer technologies. Moreover, I think uh, one of the reasons uh, why subsampling PLL is very popular, it's a low power technique, meaning it has no dividers in the feedback path that are typically very power hungry especially if you need to divide it from RF or even millimeter wave frequencies. Okay, so let's explain how the basic subsampling PLL works. The basic operation is depicted on this figure on the left. And um, what's immediately important to note is that the process of phase locking is related to sampling or to be more exact subsampling because the output period uh, can be smaller than the input frequency period or in other words the input frequency that is used for sampling is much smaller than the output uh, frequency typically basically if we have a pll that is in lock we're gonna subsample exactly the zero crossing of the vco uh, in which means that instantaneously we will sample the zero, which will bias the transconducting stage, which will not uh, dump any kind of, which will not uh, push nor pull any kind of current from the loop filter. If, however, there is a certain amount of phase mismatch between the input and the output frequency, uh, as depicted over here, for instance, when the reference phase leads the VCO output phase, uh, we will subsample typically some positive voltage which will then uh, bias the transconductor, which will then push certain amount of current into the loop filter uh, in order to change the control voltage and consequentially the operating frequency of the VCO, which will eventually correct for presence of mismatch between the input and the output frequency and phase. The subsampling PLL is indeed a simple one. And to prove that, we will go together through a design exercise, exercise of a loop like that. Now, the idea, of course, is not to bore you too much uh, with equations, uh, loop stability analysis, and so on. The idea here is to highlight the most important principles and also to build intuition behind the most important effects. Uh, what's in core in our system, of course, and that's something that we will start with, is our subsampler. And the subsampler uh, operates near the zero crossing and will ensure that we subsample some positive or some negative value which are directly proportional uh, to the amount of phase error between the input and the output phase. What you should uh, immediately intuitively see over here is that the slope with which the VCO passes through zero has actually a rather high slew rate, especially if we operate at high frequencies. And that should already intuitively uh, give you an idea of uh, the fact that the phase error detection gain in a subsampling environment is going to be large because even a small deviation from the zero crossing will uh, result with, so to speak, an explosion of information. Uh, if we want to mathematically express the phase error detection gain in a subsampling environment, uh, then we can use the following equation, which shows that the phase error detection gain is dependent uh, on the product between the AVCO and GM, where AVCO is uh, the amplitude of oscillation of our uh, voltage control oscillator, and the GM is transconductance of the transconductor used over here. Naturally, uh, this equation uh, works exclusively if we can uh, operate in small signal approximation or in other words where the phase errors are small enough. This condition is typically true during normal phase lock. Hence this equation is then valid. The transconductor is a very simple circuit uh, that resembles a charge pump. However, it does not operate with up and down pulses. You typically have 
uh, in a classical environment. In fact, what's going to happen is we're going to subsample some uh, voltages I explained earlier that is directly proportional to the amount of phase error between the input and the output. This voltage will be brought to the input differential pair as a fixed value and a certain amount of current will be produced and then mirrored to the output so that um, the current can be pushed or pulled from the loop filter in order to readjust the operating frequency of the VCO. The transconductors, transconductance is simply defined with the input pair GM and the mirroring ratios used. The loop filter used in a subsampling environment is exactly equivalent to a loop filter you can use in any analog environment, hence I will not spend too much time explaining it. For instance, I chose here um, the architecture of a loop filter which offers us one additional pole at high frequencies. Uh, it's also going to have a zero in the origin and, sorry, a pole in the origin and one additional zero for stabilization. Solving equations for stability in a subsampling environment is equivalent to solving equations for stability in a classical analog PLL. Uh, the only thing that we have to take care of is uh, once when we calculate what our open loop uh, gain is, to ensure that the unity gain appears at four times larger frequency than the zero, and that the pole appears at approximately four times larger frequency than the unity gain. In these equations, the only fundamental difference with respect to a classical loop uh, is in fact hidden within the phase error detection gain, which I already mentioned is larger than in classical analog loops. Let's assume, for example, that we want to build a system for synthesis of 1 GHz at the output with 40 MHz at the input. We prefer to have a loop with a MHz of bandwidth and we're going to use a trans transconductor in it with 100 micro siemens, KVCO of 100 MHz per volt and AVCO of 1 volt. For stabilization purposes, uh, we desire to have the zero at approximately four times lower and pull at uh, four times larger frequency than the unity gain. It turns out that to stabilize this loop with the reasonable parameters that are indicated over here, we need a rather large stabilization capacitance, almost a nanofarad. And this comes due to the fact that the phase error detection gain is really large, so we need a large capacitor to stabilize the loop. Even though the transconductance that we are using over here is not necessarily extremely large, we still end up having a large capacitor. There exists a very effective technique uh, that can be used in order to reduce the filter size and it involves redesigning a little bit our transconductor. So there is only going to be a small change. Instead of pumping uh, the current to the output of the transconductor throughout the full reference cycle, we're going to do that only during a certain opening window, a pulser opening window. And this opening window has an amount of uh, time that, uh, that is only a fraction of the overall reference period. And this will proportionally decrease the phase error detection gain. Note that the pulser opening window uh, can have several nanoseconds and it's completely independent of the instantaneously measured phase error. It only is fixed so that we reduce proportionally the phase error detection gain. By choosing uh, the pulsar operating window of 3 nanoseconds uh, out of available 25 nanoseconds we have at 40 megahertz, we can now uh, operate with a much smaller analog capacitor of 100 picofarads in order to stabilize our loop and not consume too much area that the subsampling PLL operates without any divider in the feedback path. Although it operates without any divider, we still can have our output phase at n times higher frequency than the input phase, or in other words, uh, our output frequency is at n times larger frequency than our input, but the multiplication is only virtual. There is no physical multiplication. What that also means is uh, the following. Our subsampling PLL can in fact lock 
to any integer n multiplication number in theory. The zero crossing subsampling process will actually remain intact independently on whether we, for example, pass four VCO cycles, five or even six VCO cycles in between two sampling events defined with the reference period. So that means that our PLL is completely oblivious to the integer n multiplication factor and could um, lock into false frequencies or undesired integer n multiples uh, of our reference frequencies if we are not careful enough. To ensure that the subsampling PLL locks to an accurate frequency, we typically make use of an auxiliary loop. This auxiliary loop is uh, typically built uh, out of a classical PFD detector that operates with a certain dead zone, which means that the auxiliary PFD loop can produce up and down pulses, which will change uh, voltage on our loop filter and uh, the operating frequency in the VCO, but these up and down pulses are going to be activated only when the phase error is outside of some dead zone range. Once when the correct frequency is acquired and once when the phase errors between the input and the output fall within the dead zone, uh, then the subsampling loop takes over and there is no more influence from the auxiliary loop onto the performance of our PLL. What that means is that the auxiliary loop can typically implement it without too much hassle. For example, it can also consume very little power uh, so that it doesn't impact your overall uh, performance or it can be even optionally disabled. Now, uh, I did explain the basics of the loop, but I did not uh, show you uh, where the superior noise versus power trade-off comes from. In order to explain, uh, explain why the subsampling loop is superior when it comes to phase noise performance, uh, let's first look uh, into what are the main contributors to the overall phase noise in a classical environment. We will know, very s note that uh, the in-band phase noise is mainly dominated by the charge pump noise, by the divider noise and the reference noise. This noise is also low-pass filtered in the transfer to the output, uh, which means that if you uh, make a wideband PLL for filtering the VCO noise, you will end up passing a lot of reference noise, a lot of charge pump noise and a lot of divider noise through. When it comes to power consumption, typically the highest, the dominant uh, power consumption the power consumer in this kind of environment are the dividers, the charge pump, and the VCO. Uh, the subsampling loop is a loop which enhances in-band performance, so we will concentrate on the in-band um, noise generators. To explain why a subsampling loop operates with a higher phase noise performance, given the power consumption, uh, in comparison to uh, classical, uh, analog loop, we first need to do a comparison between the phase error detection gain in a classical environment that uses a PFD charge pump and in a subsampling environment. So in a classical environment, you might end up in a situation where uh, there is a certain frequency that we have at the output, a certain signal that operates with a certain amount of phase error with respect to our input reference signal. Let's assume that the uh, phase, errors is, phase error is such that an up pulse of certain duration is produced, which will, of course, um, enable the charge pump current being pumped into the loop filter. The current we will pump into the loop filter on average depends, of course, with, uh, on the amount of phase error. It depends, of course, on the biasing of the charge pump, I. CP, and most importantly, it also depends on the refresh rate of uh, the PLL, or in other words, how often we do the comparison. Obviously, if we compare more frequently, the up 
pulse, a pulse will happen more frequently. Because, for instance, you could end up in a situation where you have the same exact frequency at the output, you could have the same amount of phase error with respect to the rising edge of our input signal, and uh, what that is going to result with is creation of the same exact up pulse. But if the original input frequency is uh, uh, smaller, or in other words, if the period is larger, in this case twice the original period, we will produce this pulse two times uh, less often. So the average current is going to be uh, reduced by a factor of two, or in other words, in general, by a factor of n, where n is actually the multiplication factor of our PLL. What this intuitively tells you is that the phase error detection gain in a classical environment is very dependent on the multiplication factor. And uh, when we are doing um, multiplications to high frequencies, this n is typically large, meaning our phase error detection gain is inherently very small. So you typically need to produce, um, to consume a lot of current in order to increase it, if you desire to do so. On the other hand, in a subsampling environment, our phase error detection gain is completely independent of the multiplication factor. So, for example, you might take a sample um, on one rate or a sample on a different rate for a fixed phase error between the input and the output uh, signal. We will always subsample the same uh, error and produce same amount of average current to the output, completely independently whether we sample on one or the other rate. One small detail to know is that this uh, pulsar opening window versus the reference period ratio is kept, fan, uh, is kept fixed independently of the multiplication number n, which is really easy to, to get. So in uh, conclusion, our phase error detection gain in a subsampling environment is completely independent of the multiplication factor, which means that inherently you will get something that it's uh, much larger, especially at higher uh, multiplication numbers than in a subsample, uh, than in a classical loop. Uh, hence, it will be necessary to consume less power in order to get high phase error detection gain. So why is the story on phase error detection gain important? Well, it's important because when you look um, into the transfer function of, or in other words, if you look into the way that the charge pump noise is transferred to the output of the system, it's actually suppressed by the phase error detection gain. So what that means is that you can benefit a lot from a large phase error detection gain. And in classical PLLs, as I said, this is dependent on the division factor. So if you have multiplication with high frequencies, it also means that the phase error detection gain is inherently very low and you need to consume a lot of power in order to, to, to increase it. Hence, typically, a classical loop has a really you know, poor noise versus power trade-off. In a subsampling environment, this phase error detection gain is inherently much larger. Hence, you have to con consume much less power in order to suppress uh, the transconductor noise. Moreover, equally important, there is simply no divider. There is no uh, division-oriented power, nor is there division-related uh, related um, uh, phase noise. Hence, this inherently creates a situation where you have much, much less uh, in-band phase noise. In fact, it turns out that typically you're going to be limited with the reference noise, which is the best situation that you uh, can have, because typically at the input we have really low input phase noise crystal oscillator. Hence, the phase locked loop can operate with wide bandwidth. It can correct for a lot of uh, you know, VCO-oriented noise, and in this way achieve very, very high figures of merit. Let's look into how we can enable fractional synthesis using uh, a subsampling PLL. Classical PLLs achieve fractional division uh, by using programmable dividers in the feedback path. These programmable dividers have in fact uh, integer n accuracy, which means that they fundamentally serve as counters of a certain amount of integer n VCO cycles, right? So their quantization accuracy is related to a one full VCO period. So for instance, if you want to divide by a fractional number, for example, 100.28, uh, 
25. <laughs> that means that f you will have to divide for a certain amount of time by 100 and then certain amount of time by 101. Or in other words, you'll have to count 100 cycles for uh, a certain amount of time and then uh, for some time 101 cycle so that on average you get the desired counting number or desired division factor. What that is going to result with is uh, having certain amount of instantaneous errors that are injected into the system. And these instantaneous errors will appear at a um, periodic rate. Hence, they will induce uh, spurs in the system. Often, we refer to these spurs as fractional spurs. Spurs are problematic when they appear in band and that's going to happen when the fractional division numbers are very close to an integer n number because then the signature of the division factor or the periodicity is very low and uh, we will have small variation which results with large spurs in band of the PLL and you don't get any benefit from the PLL based filtering and the amplitude um, of these spurs is fundamentally related to um, the amplitude of the error that is injected into the system, the instantaneous error, and that one is related to the quantization accuracy of the divider, and the divider can count only a full VCO cycle. So food th for thought could be, what if we had a divider which can count a fraction of a VCO cycle, for example one-tenth or even one-hundredth of a full VCO cycle. Well, if you had that kind of a divider with that kind of fractional accuracy, you could reduce the fundamental spurs below the noise floor. We will see later on that something like that is possible to be implemented. There is no divider in a subsampling PLL. There is also no phase modulation capabilities in a subsampling PLL. So let's look into how uh, we can synthesize fractional channels using this loop. Integer n synthesis, we're taking a sample every integer number of uh, VCO cycles. For example, in this figure, we have a multiplication by 2 where every two cycles we take a sample near the zero crossing. If we want to multiply with a fractional number, such as uh, 1.75 in this example, it will be necessary to continuously modulate the sampling event. What do we mean by that? So in this example over here, we have two VCO waveforms. The original VCO waveform is given in black for the exemplified multiplication by 2. In red is the multiplication example of 1.75. We can assume initially that both waveforms start in the same phase initially. That also means that the original sampling event can happen at the same position for both of uh, the waveforms and we will actually subsample exactly the zero crossing for both of the uh, waveforms. In the second sampling event, in order to still subsample the zero crossing of the fractional channel we are synthesizing, it will be necessary to delay the sampling ev event for a quarter of a VCO cycle. In the following sampling event, uh, this delay that we need to impose on the original sampling event to still subsample the zero crossing of the red waveform is a little larger. It's in fact twice larger. We need to delay the sampling event by half of the VCO cycle. In the third uh, event, uh, the delay that we need to impose is three quarters of a full VCO cycle. And thanks to the phase wrapping mechanism, in the fourth cycle, we can again uh, subsample exactly at the reference edge and still subsample the zero crossing of the VCO. So in order to have a fractional lock, in order to maintain the zero crossing subsampling, we need to bring certain uh, way to phase modulate the sampling event. And we can implement that with a simple digital to time converter. So the digital to time converter is a block that can instantaneously modulate uh, the edge at which we will subsample. Note that this DTC needs to cover at least one full VCO period of delay in order to uh, enable fractional synthesis. The computational path in front of the DTC is fairly simple. 
basically you need a delta sigma modulator in this example it's only a first order delta sigma modulator which intakes the fractional multiplication number um, and produces at the output a stream of uh, integer n values that on average give exactly the division factor which we want to achieve but instantaneously on the integer n values in other words this ds number will simply jump between 2 and 1 in av so that on average it gives 1.75 the diff value is simply a result of subtraction of the original multiplication number and ds and as such will jump between 0.25 and negative 0.75. After that the diff value is accumulated or integrated uh, in such a way that a triangular waveform is produced. This triangular waveform or sawtooth waveform uh, is exactly direct representation of the amount of delay you need to create with the DTC in order to subsample the zero crossing uh, for the given fractional multiplication number. So what that also means is that since that you don't need in principle uh, delay larger than a full VCO cycle in order to maintain a, uh, an accurate fractional lock because this ACC value, the green signal, never goes above one. After that the only thing that it's left to do is of course uh, to scale this value uh, to the DTC input um, and since we have still in what in theory is a number with fractional accuracy or with floating accuracy we need to round it to the available DTC input range. Let's assume for a moment that we can operate with an ideal DTC. In this kind of environment, we will be able to always subsample the zero crossing and our original loop will in fact remain completely intact. That means that using a DTC opens up the possibility to really have no difference between integer and or fractional and performance. And what I mean by that is an ideal DTC uh, can enable true fractional synthesis or fractional division that we were uh, dreaming about a couple of slides ago. And this lies in stark contrast to classical loops because with an ideal DTC you actually end up in a situation where there is no spurs, no fractional spurs at the output. Unfortunately, of course, a DTC is just a data converter, uh, which means that it will have limited resolution, random noise. It also could have some gain, imbalance, or nonlinearities. And these have to be uh, carefully assessed not to impact your performance too much, especially since a DTC is at the input of the system. So that means that all the non-idealities at its output are going to be multiplied by n square in transfer to the output. So we have to be careful. All the errors are also low pass filtered by the PLL, as we know as all the other noise coming from the reference of the system. This is the reason why uh, we will now dedicate a full section on how to design a digital to time converter. A simple DTC can be implemented at a, as a tunable delay line. To the input of this delay line, we bring a square wave, um, which will induce discharging. Uh, with variable slope depending on the amount of capacitance uh, at the node Vx and the um, second inverter in the chain or competitor in the chain will restore the steep slope and this steep slope can be then used for sampling purposes. Note that the DTC input and output have the same exact frequency, they're just shifted in phase and this phase shift is programmable. Now intuitively you should already notice that um, it's actually fairly easy to achieve uh, delay modulation with 100 femtosecond accuracy. And uh, this can be achieved by um, sizing the changing capacitors and the driving strength of the inverter. And I can already tell you now that since this uh, value over here is much, much smaller than a full VCO period, uh, the quantization noise induced by this DTC can be kept below random noise floor um, that we have in the system. Indeed, the DTC uh, quantization errors can be low, but you can also shape them. As I showed earlier, there is this DTC quantization path, but you can also place an additional delta sigma modulator in front of um, the DTC itself, which serves for digital shaping of the quantization residue. So for instance, um, you can uh, in fact shape all the quantization noise out of PLL band, where it will get inherently 
filtered by the PLL. We know the PLL is a low-pass filter. And in this way, we can really operate with um, phase noise levels due to the um, quantization noise of the DTC that are very, very well below the other noise sources. Uh, the equation that guards um, the amount of phase noise inband of the PLL is shown over here. And you can see that uh, when, uh, if you put numbers in this equation, you can see that even at 10 gigahertz or so, you can get uh, in-band noise so low that it will virtually not impact your overall performance. So quantization noise can be kept low enough. But what about analog noise uh, or white and flicker noise that are incorporated in our delay generation mechanism? So if you have a, a delay line, as I explained earlier, there is uh, definitely uh, one transistor, for in this case can be modeled as a saturated uh, current source, which is going to discharge uh, the relevant node in the system and as such create delay. Uh, this is actually the programmable slope we talked about. And of course, um, the programmable uh, slope can be programmed with the amount of capacitors, capacitor that loads um, this current source. What's very important is that this discharging will be impacted both by flicker and white noise. It turns out that the white noise is proportional to the amount of delay we're creating, but also reversely proportional uh, to the discharging strength of this saturated current source. So uh, for the largest delay, you can always increase power consumption um, in, so that you get the, um, uh, the noise low enough, at least the white noise contribution. To do the same with flicker noise is not so trivial. If you do um, an analysis, you will notice that if you have such an environment, in order to reduce the flicker noise, typically you need to increase both width and the length of the discharging transistor. Especially, you know, in these new nodes where the 1 over F corners is at very, very high frequencies, this can be a problem. And uh, the consequence of uh, this is gonna be that the previous stage inverter over here is going to be heavily loaded which means that when it instantaneously toggles it will create pull large amount of charge from the supply and potentially create a large ripple on the supply and these ripples can easily be incorporated in your clean linear discharging slopes and um, this is something that can create distortion in the system so basically when it comes to these digital to time converters you have to be very careful um, because any kind of digital delay line is very susceptible to noise in the supply because it's all going to be incorporated into your signal eventually so in order to reduce the problem what we typically do is we use rc based discharging and what i mean by that is this r is really a polysilicon resistor which is now an order of magnitude larger in resistance than this nmos which is now used as a switch and not a as a current source so what that means is that um, the overall discharging will be exponential, but we will still have delay as a linear function uh, of the amount of loading we have at the output uh, of our delay generating machine. Since the discharging is determined completely with a polysilicon resistor, which dominates the resistance in this branch, um, there is no flicker noise contribution and the white noise can be easily be kept below the desired level. Since this transistor now is only a switch, it can have minimum length uh, and certain width, but overall um, it will not load the previous stage too much, which means when the previous stage toggles, it will not create too much ripple. And even if there is some ripple on the supply, it will only modulate, you know, the resistance of this switch, which is already an order of magnitude smaller than the dominant polysilicon resistor. Hence, it will not impact uh, our discharging slopes and it will not add into distortion in the system. Turns out that code dependency in our power consumption is rather problematic in this digitally intensive environments. And in order to uh, suppress potential distortion that these effects can induce, what we typically do is we, in parallel to our delay stage, also use a delay stage replica, which is always loaded with exactly complementary code. In this way, we ensure that always the same amount of charge is pulled from the supply and there is no code-dependent ripples or uh, dips on our overall supply. Also, 
very importantly, the competitors that are used in our main path in order, in order to restore the steep slopes which are then used to drive the sampling mechanism also uh, toggle at a code dependent moment in time. So in order to protect our overall supply, we uh, typically regulate uh, the internal supply of uh, the competitors uh, so that this uh, instantaneous dip does not propagate elsewhere in the system and create distortion. Last consideration which I want to talk about when it comes to DTC design is the limited bandwidth of the competitor. Uh, basically, these competitors which restore the steep slopes in order to drive the sampler uh, typically are not completely independent of the input slope. Uh, what that means is that they will uh, not instantaneously flip and hence they will create some code dependent variation or distortion uh, in the amount of delay that is produced. So the larger the range you need to produce with your DTC with variable slope, uh, the larger the nonlinearity. This nonlinearity is not you know extreme uh, it's not necessarily very problematic but just to give you an idea you could have 0.2 percent of INL of the full range given the range is 500 picoseconds solutions to this nonlinearity are uh, typically um, in constant slope DTCs uh, they are not covered in my presentation but you have to go through the same set of considerations which I showed earlier if you build one or you could look into calibration which I would in fact recommend but that's a discussion for uh, the following section in general I showed here that a DTC can operate with low quantization noise uh, which means that it will not limit your performance of the PLL and also if you're careful enough you can get the low random analog noise so in principle uh, there is really uh, a possibility a realistic possibility that even with a realistic ADC uh, you can maintain close to integer M performance although you're operating in fractional end mode as we will see um, this has to be uh, this has to be guarded with some digital calibration techniques but nevertheless the fundamental idea works and a DTC can provide um, a DTC based PLL can operate with very good phase noise performance. I want to um, say that a DTC based environment really is a powerful environment independently whether you're uh, synthesizing uh, uh, frequency using subsampling technique or some other technique. Why is that? So let's for a moment compare a DTC to a uh, to a TDC. A time to digital converter is basically an analog to digital converter because it transforms an analog value uh, which is in this context time or a phase error into digital information. A DTC is a duck because it transforms a digital value into analog information and they both serve uh, in principle for phase error detection in your phase error detection path of the PLL. So if somebody approaches you and asks you, look, um, would you like to design a DTC or an ADC uh, in order to perform the same exact task? I would personally choose a DUC because DUC is easier to design and it typically can operate with a higher performance than an ADC. In fact, an ADC has uh, a DUC as a building block. A TDC in this context typically operates with uh, quantization accuracy related to a single gate DLA, which you typically encounter when you go for a straightforward vernier line implementation. Um, and this uh, delay is typically in order of 10 picoseconds, even in some advanced nanometer CMOS. On the other hand, a delay line, as I said earlier, can easily operate with an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude uh, lower quantization error. Hence, this is, should give you an indication why a DTC-based environment is, you know, um, a, a better, uh, is always going to outperform a TDC-based environment. Today's uh, digital PLLs are becoming more and more DTC based. Uh, it turns out you can elegantly use both a DTC and a TDC in your phase error detection path. Since they can be used for the same uh, purpose, you can cover increasingly larger range with uh, a DTC for phase error compensation and then operate with your time to digital converter on a decreased range. And as I said, as I argued earlier, a DTC is more efficient than a TDC uh, when it comes to uh, added quantization noise uh, 
into the system. And this DTC phase, uh, favoring trade-off has recently resulted in a large popularity of a single bit DDCs, where basically most of the work is covered by a di digital to time converter, and then a TDC exclusively operates with the bang bang operation and provides only a single bit information towards the output. When it comes to DTC based environments, it is also possible to make a DTC based digital subsampling PLL. This can, for instance, be done by putting a quantizer or an analog to digital converter after the sample has been taken. Note that the ADC will uh, produce some additional quantization noise into the system, but this one can be typically suppressed again by the high phase error detection gain, which can also even be enhanced by some amplification. There is also added quantization noise that we have to handle of the DCO, uh, but if the loop filter sizes are priority, you can also look into DTC-based digital subsampling PLLs section, we will look into randomization and background calibration techniques that can, have, uh, that can help with uh, non-idealities of the DTC. So I want to recall that the input to the DTC is in fact a periodic signal, right? Because we have to compensate for a periodically accumulated fractional residue. And the DTC cancel the fractional uh, residue, but with certain accuracy. If we had a completely linear environment, uh, the zero crossing subsampling is very, very uh, accurate. But if there is a certain amount of gain errors or uh, INL error in the DTC transfer function, we could end up uh, having certain amount of error propagating through our loop. Error injected into the system has the signature of the fractional multiplication number because the periodicity um, of the signal brought to the input of the DTC, or in other words, the delay uh, that the DTC needs to produce is very periodic. Hence, uh, any kind of non-ideality will also create periodic, periodic errors, with, which result with fractional spurs at the output. And these fractional spurs um, are injected at the input of the system, which means that they are nicely low-pass filtered in transfer to the output. But for deep in-band frequencies, again, you do not get any filtering. Now, uh, I don't want you to think that uh, this is a specific problem of DTC-based environments, because it's not. Nonlinearities or gain errors in the phase error detection path are a problem present in classical PLLs. They are typically related to the mismatch between the up and down uh, pools. They are also present in digital environments. Uh, so, for example, you have the same problem if a TDC has a nonlinear uh, transfer function or has a gain imbalance. Equally, uh, the DTC is a problem in DTC-based environments because DTC is the core building block in the phase error detection path. I would even argue that uh, the problem is by using a DTC already smaller than in the other environments. But let's see how, we, how can we deal with this problem. First of all, you could randomize the error that the DTC produces. And this is really trivial in subsampling environments. You know, I said earlier that we uh, subsample the nearest zero crossing um, when we apply the periodic input signal to the DTC. But in principle, we could randomly choose any of the available zero crossings uh, that appear after the reference edge. So for example, you could sometimes skip a full cycle and subsample the nearest, the next nearest zero crossing or, subs or skip two cycles and so on. And in this way, you can in fact uh, mask the periodicity of the fractional error compensation. What this results with is uh, the energy of the spurs simply spreads into noise. So you don't see any more uh, spurs at the output, but the in-band phase noise will rise as the consequence. In some applications, uh, this is good enough if you don't care for the in-band uh, phase noise. But I have to admit, this kind of defeats the purpose of a subsampling PLL, because in principle, subsampling PLL is uh, a low in-band noise PLLs.
the modifications that need to be incorporated in our original um, D DTC input code propagation path when it comes to randomization are trivial. So basically, we just need to create a pseudo-random uh, number generator with adds, which adds a random integer uh, at the input over here. Now, uh, there is a caveat to this story, and it's related to the fact that if we do use randomization, we also need to use a DTC that can cover a larger range. And with larger range, uh, typically we are also exposing ourselves to potentially larger nonlinearity and larger gain error. So this is kind of a trade-off of, of this technique that has to be taken into account to really cancel the problem of DTC inaccuracy, we could use the principle of pre-distortion. Pre-distortion is a simple uh, technique that we know from ducks. Uh, the idea is, of course, if uh, you know what kind of nonlinearity or what kind of error a DTC produces, you can simply use a lookup table approach and pre-compensate the digital code that you're sending to the DTC in order to get the desired effect anyway. So for example, if you have two LSBs of error on code 100, you can simply send code 98 to the DTC in order to get the desired analog defect, effect. Now, um, the um, measuring the DTC transfer curve is not completely trivial. Uh, we are talking about 100 femtosecond delay step accuracy, and you, in order to measure the DTC transfer function, you typically need a lot of averaging uh, to get to this accuracy, even with the most modern oscilloscopes available in the lab today. Even if you manage to measure the DTC transfer function, and I have some uh, um, literature that points you uh, to this to solution to this problem back in the, in my references, even if you manage to measure the DTC transfer function, it is still susceptible to PVT errors. Uh, so delay lines are simply very sensitive to supply variation, temperature variation, and uh, you do absolutely need some sort of background calibration in order to resolve this problem. Even if you use um, even if you use the constant slope DTCs that are more resilient to INL errors, they still necessitate some sort of uh, background calibration. Hence, I think it's very important to look into it. When it comes to DTC calibration, it is important to note that in presence of gain or nonlinearities in the phase error detection path, there is going to be a strong correlation between the instantaneous current generated by our phase error detector and the instantaneously used DTC input code. Or in other words, the errors produced uh, by our phase error detector over time will not be random as if uh, as they would be if there is no gain or INL errors in a phase error detection path, they will be colored or they will have a signature of the DTC input codes on them. And as I said, they will appear uh, with certain periodicity that will create spurs at the output, but also that will create a certain signature on the instantaneously measured errors over time at the output of our phase error detector. Once again, at a certain DTC input code, uh, you might have some positive error, which will uh, result with sampling some you know, negative voltage or other way around. And the sign of the instantaneous current pushed to the input uh, to the loop filter will be directly related to the code that we used. In principle, in order to populate accurately our lookup table, we could measure or let's say minimize, try to minimize the correlation between the DTC input codes and the instantaneously measured errors at the output of our phase error detector. In fact, if this lookup table was perfect, or if we had no uh, errors, uh, no nonlinearities in our phase error detection path, there simply would be no correlation uh, between the DTC input code and the instantaneously measured phase errors. So uh, we can use this correlation in order to populate the lookup table and achieve this goal.
In practice, the measured current at the output of the phase error detector is an analog value, and we will implement all this calibration in the digital domain, which means that it's necessary first to convert the analog value into digital information. It turns out that it is enough only to look at the sign of the error that we uh, are looking at, which I already talked about a couple of slides ago. So uh, we don't need a multi-bit error detection. It turns out it's enough only to have a single bit error detection. Let's look into how is this in practice implemented. So in the core of our calibration engine, we have a lookup table which stores information on DTC gain or INL errors. If there are no errors in the system, the lookup table is simply populated with zero values and the original DTC code can be simply sent to the input of the DTC without any correction. Nothing actually comes from the lookup table which changes the original input. If there are certain errors in the system, if there is some INL in the system, then the lookup table contains information about these errors. And before the original code can be propagated to the output, we will look at the particular address, the address of the code that it's currently used, in order to see what is the appropriate correction value we need to subtract from the original value in order to pre-restored accordingly the input of the DDC and get to the desired analog effect. If the lookup table isn't populated with the correct correction coefficients, then the correction will be unsuccessful and we will not subsample uh, near the zero crossing but create some systematic error that is related to the used DTC uh, input codes. What that also means is that the lookup table needs to be updated and we desire to make this uh, updating in the background as the PLL operates normally. To do that, we will use the information about the error sign coming out of the phase error detector. And this error sign in practice tells us did the DTC sample soon, late, or correctly. So for example, uh, if we sample the soon, we might get uh, some uh, positive errors or positive signs at the output on average. If we sample on average a little bit too late, we're going to get a stream of uh, probably negative uh, ones at the output. But if we sample correctly, given the code, this stream will be zero mean on average. In any case, we can use the instantaneously measured error sign uh, to increment, after scaling, to increment the particular uh, correction coefficient in the lookup table. The correction coefficient we are going to address is dependent on the DTC input code. In this way, the lookup table correction coefficients slowly adjust themselves uh, into a value which then efficiently compensates for the presence of the error in in the DTC transfer curve. In this way, we will subsample near the zero crossing and the error sign stream will become a zero mean stream per particular code and the lookup table uh, correction coefficients fix their position. For example, we could operate with nonlinearity of the DTC, which uh, in, is indicated in this simulation environment by the red curve. Instead of actually placing a correction coefficient in the lookup table for every possible input code of the DTC, in this example a 10-bit uh, DTC, we only use 32 correction coefficients and then piecewise linear approximation between the codes that don't have a direct uh, correction coefficients for compensation. In this way, the lookup table does not really need to be 10-bit large. It can only, for instance, be 5-bit, or in other words, we can only have, uh, let's say, 32 correction values uh, in order to compensate for the complete nonlinearity of the system you need to add a little bit of additional processing around your lookup table in order to operate with piecewise linear approximation. But this is not something that uh, will take a lot of power. 
um, or uh, compromise your area because it's uh, actually simple shift registers typically. The lookup table with piecewise linear approximation can then be much smaller and not take a large portion of your system nor have a significant impact on your overall power consumption. In this slide, I show an example of how the correction coefficients propagate towards their, uh, their final value where they compensate for the existing nonlinearity in the system accurately. You see that uh, this propagation, the speed of propagation, can be adjusted based on the gain on this uh, LMS algorithm, on this bang-bang LMS algorithm. The larger the gain, the faster the convergence, but with uh, the largest gains, you might end up uh, with substantial noise around the accurate value, which you want to avoid not to impact the performance of the PLL. One detail that I skipped to, uh, to explain so far is the, the way in which we extract the error uh, from uh, the phase error detector. As I said earlier, uh, for uh, lowering the phase error detection gain, our output current is only pulsed. Uh, to the loop filter over a full reference cycle, which means that the useful current is propagated to the loop filter only during a specific time opening. Uh, the rest of the time, you're free to steer the current to wherever you want. And you could, in principle, steer it, for example, to a dummy node, uh, which is always, after every cycle, reset to the low-pass filter uh, potential. And in this way, you can track the variation of the voltage is going towards some positive or to some negative value. And you can put a comparator on this node, which will give you a direct indication of what uh, the instantaneously measured error is without too much analog overhead. One important detail related to the error extraction is that you do not want to have any kind of uh, input referred offset uh, on the extraction node. Why is that? Well, a type 2 PLL that we are discussing over here settles in a zero offset condition in which the average current coming at the output of our transconductor is zero mean by definition. Unfortunately, if there is a certain amount of offset in the error extraction path, uh, although we have no uh, errors in the system, uh, there is a zero mean stream uh, coming at the output of our transconductor, the calibration algorithm will still receive offsetted uh, stream, meaning there is, for example, going to be too many ones uh, and uh, much less negative ones coming in our gain calibration process and or INL calibration process. And that will eventually res result with the drift of coefficients, which can result um, with additional noise or even divergence of your coefficients. One way to resolve the offset in the error extraction process is to compensate for existence of it in the digital domain. So basically what you can do is there is a way to modify the stream of positive ones and negative ones in such a way that we still get a zero mean stream. We periodically overrule the original stream to get to the desired effect. Naturally, this will add a little bit of noise in the estimation process, but it will not impact overall the operation of the PLL. I did not go to more details into implementation of this offset compensation algorithm in this presentation, uh, but I refer to more details in uh, the references later on. Note also that uh, there are certain solutions where this problem is resolved in the analog domain. I think uh, this is also a valid approach, but typically mixed mode solutions um, are a little bit more sensitive. Okay, in summary, I want to say that indeed, basic, building a DTC-based subsampling PLL can result with a fractional N performance, which is equivalent to integer N performance. Or in other words, we can um, enable an environment which can operate with integrated phase noise numbers, which is equal to the integrated phase noise numbers you have in integer N performance. Or in other words, uh, if you're careful enough, uh, you do not destroy the core analog uh, subsampling loop performance. How did we achieve that? Well, I showed that you can do the, that by carefully um, maintaining the LSB of the DTC low enough with analog, uh, with careful analog approach. The DTC 
uh, can operate with low noise, low random noise, and uh, is resilient to supply noise. If you're careful with your analog design, and if there are some gain or INL errors, we can efficiently compensate for them in the digital environment. I showed you here how digitally enhanced analog can really make wonders uh, in exploiting modern CMOS uh, for uh, efficient linearization and getting the best out of the high performance analog core we use in our environment. Note also that all the algorithms which are shown here can be reused in other architectures, in other DTC based architectures, for example, in digital PLLs, bang bang PLLs, type 1 subsampling PLL sampling, digital subsampling PLLs, and so on part of my presentation, I want to explore ways in which you can enhance the DTC-based fractional and subsampling PLL also for phase modulation. What is uh, motivation to do so? Well, first of all, we have this powerful modulation technique in our system based on a DTC. Second of all, um, a PLL uh, as a phase modulator is always part of a polar transmitter. And polar transmitters have proven to be today very power efficient. They can be digitally intensive and they can operate with very high power efficient numbers. In, the, in those PLLs, the accuracy of communication is typically limited with integrated phase noise of the PLL. Or in other words, the fundamental limit on the error vector magnitude measured at the output of our transmitter is going to be limited by the integrated phase noise of the PLL. So what that means is that with low phase noise PLLs, we can achieve very low EVMs. And that can enable very complex constellation schemes. Here is an example of 1024 QAM, uh, which means that uh, thanks to uh, DTC-based subsampling PLL, we could in principle achieve really high spectral efficiency. And uh, in today's world where spectrum is a scarce resource, this is typically what you want to achieve. Now, one important challenge, as you will see, is wideband modulation, because uh, all of this is for nothing if we cannot have uh, wide band modulation or um, high data rates. In classical PLLs, phase modulation can be easily uh, achieved uh, through the programmable divider. So instead of only for fractional synthesis, we can also use the divider for periodic modulation. Uh, in order to achieve that, you only need to feed also the modulation data into the programmable divider. Very important in this process, uh, we will low-pass filter the data in transfer to the output. We know that the PLL is a really good low-pass filter for anything that is injected at the input of the system. Hence, this approach has very limited bandwidth. To extend the bandwidth, people have tried to apply uh, different pre-distortion techniques. So what that means is that you overemphasize the digital data at high frequencies so that you prolong uh, the modulation bandwidth or extend the modulation bandwidth of the PLL, uh, or in theory even achieve an all pass. Unfortunately, the old pass here is not easily achievable, especially because, uh, you know, digital filters get a little bit inaccurate on uh, uh, frequencies close to Nyquist. But even uh, more than that, the problem is typically that uh, it's difficult to estimate which PLL bandwidth we have in the analog domain and which exactly the pre-distortion uh, cutoff frequency needs to be. So this all operates with very limited accuracy. To achieve a true all pass of the data to the output, the modulation signal can be injected twice into the loop. Once through the point one injection, where we, which we know from before, and it follows a certain low pass filtering profile to the output. For the second time, the same data is injected in the frequency domain in front of the VCO. And this data follows a high pass transfer function towards the output. So basically what happens is that when you add these two transfer functions together, you end up having a true all pass of the data to the output. I sometimes get a question where if you really have an all pass transfer function to the output, what is um, the limitation on the bandwidth with which we can modulate? Well, in principle, the modulation bandwidth, simply put, will then be limited with the clock rate with which you modulate. Just like in any other digital to analog converter, we have to respect the old-fashioned Nyquist rate.
Note very importantly that an all pass transfer to the output also means a no pass to the loop. What that means is that um, the modulation data is completely cancelled uh, in front of the phase error detection. So in other words, our loop filter, our loop in fact, is completely intact with the modulation data. It's completely oblivious to the modulation data and it sees the same voltage variation it would have during normal fractional synthesis. So it's completely insensitive to the modulation data. This of course is true exclusively, all of this theory is true exclusively, is if injection is accurate, or in other words, if both point 0.1 and point 0.2 do not have um, any kind of gain or nonlinearities in the injection. Moreover, it's important to note that we also uh, must ensure that the injection doesn't have any kind of time inaccuracies. We will look into that in a second. Just like in classical PLLs, we can also operate uh, the DTC-based subsampling PLL as a phase modulator. The modifications you need to do in order to enable a modulation using the PLL are trivial. The phase modulation data can simply be injected in front of the DTC. Injecting only in a single point uh, within the PLL will result with low pass uh, transfer of the data to the output. This uh, effectively means that we will not be able to modulate beyond the bandwidth of the PLL. However, a subsampling PLL is a wideband PLL, so you might get a little bit further using this loop rather than a classical uh, loop. Phase modulation can be also observed from the time domain. Uh, what's going to happen is that a DTC will, under the influence of the modulation data, simply enforce certain error, or it will on purpose subsample away from the zero crossing to make sure that the VCO accumulates desired modulation phase. Note that as long as the modulation data uh, is low in frequencies, the variation around the zero crossing is going to be slow and we will not have large instantaneous errors. Hence, the PLL, the PLL will be capable of changing if operating frequency. The loop will have time in order to change, uh, in order to react to the modulation data. So if we would try to modulate with high frequency, uh, uh, in time domain, what that means is that the DTC would try to induce larger errors or subsample further away from the zero crossing. Uh, that has several uh, consequences. First one is, well, the PLL will not be able to react uh, fast enough in order to really instantaneously shift the operating phase by this much. So this will uh, take certain time and that's where the low pass filtering in fact come from intuitively. Another important thing is that with uh, subsampling away from the zero crossing, we will enter the region in which the linear range of phase error detection gain is not anymore respected. And this might impose additional distortion in the system. For example, if you want to push this process even further, we might try to pre-distort the data as we uh, originally explained. But what that means in the subsampling domain is the following. In time domain, pre-distortion means we will increase the instantaneous purposeful errors even further in order to compensate um, for the final reaction time of the PLL. And our concerns from the previous slide related to linearity are now even more pronounced. I mean, we could even induce clipping since we have a limited linear detection range. So this is not really a way to go if you want to extend the modulation bandwidth when it comes to DTC-based subsampling environment. Achieve a true all pass of the data to the output, we can use, again, two-point modulation. In context of a DTC-based subsampling PLL, this means that we will inject the modulation data twice into the system, once in front of the VCO, and for the second time through the DTC. Uh, the point 2 follows a high-pass profile to the output, and the point 1 through the DTC follows a low-pass filter profile to the input. When added together, we truly get an all-pass of the data through the output using this hybrid loop, where we use digital modulation in point 2, digital modulation in point 1, but an analog subsampling loop.
Note that this all pass of the data to the output also means that we have a no pass of the data to the input. Or in other words, our filter will be completely resilient to any modulation data. It will operate independently of our modulation data without any awareness of it. What that means in the time domain is the following. So point two will simply enforce change of the operating frequency of the VCO in such a way that the original zero crossing uh, during fractional end synthesis will be moved. Since the DTC is aware we are trying to pass this signal to the output, uh, the DTC will receive uh, this, the information about the amount of phase error that we accumulated on purpose and it will still enforce the zero cross subsampling. In this way uh, we are still sampling exactly near the zero crossing and then there is no, con no uh, concern about going beyond the linear detection range of the phase error detector. Since the DTC now again subsamples the zero crossings, the PLL operates in the range where all small signal approximations are again correct. What that also consequentially means is that we will be capable of reusing all our calibration algorithms once again because uh, there is no virtual change with respect to how the basic loop had been operating in fractional end mode. In this way, we, only, we already compensated for half of our problem. So any kind of 0.1 inaccuracies, DTC gain or INL errors, can be recalibrated out as explained previously. At the same time, uh, we could also have a lot of gain or nonlinearities in 0.2 injection. For example, uh, we could have nonlinear capacitance to frequency conversion, especially at wide bandwidths. To compensate for the nonlinearities or gain imbalance in digital to frequency conversion related to point two injection, we can reuse the same calibration principles that we used in order to calibrate our point one injection, or in other words, the DTC gain or nonlinearity. Um, the only difference over here is, of course, that the lookup tables are going to be populated based on correlation with the DTC input code. Thanks to the fact that the DTC input codes and um, the DAC input codes can be in decoupled one from another, it is possible uh, to operate all this calibration in the background simultaneously. And in this way, the DTC-based uh, subsampling modulator uh, can operate without any gain or nonlinearity uh, imbalance during two point modulation. Once again, background calibration simply means that two point injection gain imbalance and nonlinearities are resolved. The duck induces the desired frequency shift and the DTC induces the desired time delay. Although there are no gain or nonlinearities in the two point injection now, there could still be some timing inaccuracies. So, for example, the duck could induce correct frequency shift, but at a wrong moment in time. Uh, where could that come from? You could uh, have this effect coming from, for example, a non-instant frequency shift in the VCO, right? The VCO does not react immediately, or you could have a certain amount of clock skew in the injection. This effect is not that relevant for slow modulation, but when you're looking into modulation bandwidths beyond 10 megahertz, it might have an impact on your system. So we will look uh, for a couple of slides. In Let's assume that we desire to shift the operating frequency of the VCO at every falling edge of the clock. So, and let's also assume that the VCO has no gain or nonlinearity in injection point two, or in other words, that it actually does the correct frequency uh, shift, but it does the correct frequency shift at the wrong moment in time. In fact, the difference between the moment in time at which we expect the frequency to change and uh, the actual uh, moment at which the frequency changed, uh, we will indicate that time with tau d and call delay spread.
A consequence of delay spread will be that the VCO will start accumulating phase at a different frequency at the wrong moment in time. And the DTC, if not aware of delay spread, will simply subsample at the wrong place away from the zero crossing and uh, the PLL will try to compensate for this effect, creating distortion in the signal propagation path to the output. It is important to note that our two-point phase modulator can still propagate linear information to its output, uh, given that the DTC is informed about the amount of delay spread in the system. In other words, we can still pre-distort the DTC input code so that it subsamples the zero crossing and so that no undesired uh, loop filtering is imposed on our modulation signal. To do that, we use the correction coefficient C, which actually indicates um, the percentage of the time of the full reference cycle at which we operated at the wrong frequency. So in presence of no delay spread whatsoever, then C is simply zero. And the code sent to the DTC, or the phase modulation signal, is computed only based on the given modulations cycle uh, frequency change. If, however, there is a certain amount of delay spread in the system, then C simply becomes a non-zero value. It will be some small value in between zero and one. And then the DTC input is going to be computed uh, for phase compensation. It will be computed not only on the given cycle or on the um, last modulation signal frequency change, but also on the one in the cycle before. And in this way, the DTC still subsampled the zero crossing, even though there is a delay spread and you can in principle manually set this C uh, coefficient for accurate two tap based pre-distortion. Alternatively, the necessary correction coefficient C can be calculated in the background and to uh, enable background uh, estimation of this correction coefficient, we need simply to track the correlation between the change in the modulation signal and the instantaneously measured error sign. And the correlation here uh, is executed based on multiplication and then integration with certain scaling of uh, these two signals. C will then simply drift towards some positive or uh, value uh, which will correctly estimate the amount of delay spread in the system and ensure that the DTC subsamples the zero crossings on uh, average independently of what frequency modulation signal we desire to have at the output. Finally, this means that we are operating in a two-point injection environment uh, that uh, operates effectively without any injection gain or nonlinearity imbalance thanks to the background calibration algorithms. Uh, moreover, we can operate without any timing mismatch, hence it's gonna be possible to modulate at any desired modulation bandwidth. In the core of a system, we still have our low noise uh, synthesizer, the subsampling PLL, which uh, actually remains operating with performance equivalent to integer n operation, or you know, the section one of our talk, thanks to the fact that there are nonlinearities or timing mismatches. And that, as explained earlier, can lead to very efficient communication, very spectrally efficient communications since uh, the measured EVM will typically be very low. With my final slide, I would like to leave you with uh, three key takeaway uh, messages. The first one is we showed how an analog subsampling core can really enable extremely low noise operation and low power environments for high figures of merit. The analog subsampling core has a very high phase error detection gain, which leads to power efficient suppression of any in-band noise within the system. The second takeaway message is that a DTC is a very powerful phase modulator. A DTC is a block that can operate with low quantization and low analog noise, hence you will be able to get uh, the most out of your system. Finally, for fractional synthesis and for modulation to be truly accurate, 
in order to truly operate with fractional accuracies or modulation accuracies that are equivalent to the integer n basic subsampling operation, we can look into digital background calibration engines, and these can be implemented very efficiently um, in the modern uh, nanometer CMOS and can enhance and give you the best out of your uh, analog subsampling core. Uh, please note that in my references, you will be able to find more information about the basic integer and subsampling PLL, if you're interested, uh, about uh, digital to time conversion uh, principles. You will also be able to find additional material on fractional and subsampling uh, synthesis, and also on randomization and background calibration techniques for DTC-based PLLs references related to phase frequency modulation if you're interested uh, are listed on this slide thank you kindly for your attention and i am already looking forward uh, to any questions you might have about my talk Thank you. Uh, that was a great talk. Um, so this is time for questions now. Um, so if audience, if you have questions, please uh, type your question in the chat window, and I'll read it here, and, and uh, um, we'll, we'll get answered. So um, and uh, except the author, and uh, I would ask others, I'll request others to please mute their their lines. So um, I have a question to begin with. Um, so um, how would you compare the performance of a subsampling PLL to that of an injection locking PLL? I'm sorry, I really did not uh, understand the question. There seems to be a lot of background noise. Could you please repeat the question or maybe even type it down on our team chat? Uh, sure. Um, what, how does the performance of an injection log PLL compare to that of a subsampling PLL? And uh, Okay, so I understood the question. Uh, the question is, um, how does uh, yeah an injection locked PLL uh, compare to a subsampling uh, PLL? Uh, indeed, if you look into uh, the recent uh, state of the art, uh, which you know trades off, which shows what are the most efficient ways to synthesize with very little chit jitter, uh, you can notice that. Um, injection locking and subsampling are the ones that uh, push uh, far state of the art. There are now some new techniques also. We saw charge sharing and uh, one bit uh, TDC based or bang bang loops are also uh, becoming more and more efficient. Uh, in subsampling loops, you have these uh, classical uh, equations, analog equations, which you can use in order to, you know, um, uh, in order to generate, uh, in order to stabilize your PLL, in injection locking, the the profile, the filtering profile, uh, the way the loop locks, uh, the problems are a little bit different. So, so we're looking into two different uh, architectures, also from um, design effort. Um, I uh, personally like uh, maybe this question is best answered by looking at the at, at the art in the field. So if I have to uh, just analyze uh, what's going on uh, with respect to figures of merit, I see that uh, the the subsampling techniques are currently a little bit in the lead. Uh, but uh, without digging in into details. Uh, you know, underneath the the carpet of both of the techniques is difficult to to say which one will result with uh, better noise. Okay, you're not. Uh, 
the author, if I would request you to please mute your line. So um, there was another question that was asked uh, uh, by an audience member regarding the power consumption of the of the frequency lock loop. Uh, could you comment on that, especially for millimeter wave applications? Well, um, in uh, context of uh, subsampling architecture, it is important to note that uh, once when the PLL locks, once when the subsampling loop takes over uh, the phase lock, it still does have a frequency, um, frequency tra tracking capabilities. So it, it is capable, uh, as a standalone loop, maintain phase and frequency lock. It's only incapable of uh, distinguishing between uh, frequencies uh, of the reference that are integer n apart. Um, with respect to the reference frequency, so integer and multiplication uh, factor change. So in principle, once when you achieve uh, the, the desired uh, frequency multiplication, it is possible to automatically disabled, disable your, um, your frequency tracking in the main loop. It's possible, like at RF, we completely disable it and the loop maintains lock. Uh, or you can, for instance, put it in some uh, low power mode to save power. In general, um, the division path um, is um, uh, is not really something you have to worry about when it comes to its noise performance or um, robustness because it's not gonna uh, well noise performance uh, because it's not gonna impact your overall performance once when the sa sampling loop uh, takes over. So um, yeah, from that perspective, it's it's at least a, an easier uh, an easier problem to solve. Thank you. Uh, if there are no other questions, then um, this concludes today's session. And uh, I would like to thank all of our speakers for their time and participation. We really appreciate it. And thank you everyone in the audience who tuned in. So this session was recorded and will be made available for viewing later. And uh, uh, we thank you and ha have a great rest of the day. And we hope you'll join us for the rest of the CICC 2020 virtual conference. Goodbye.